This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. He said, there are main purpose of doing this is to undermine the great progress that has been made in the ongoing liberation of recent victories. That's uh, Mohamed Ibrahim Moalimu, a member of Somalia's federal parliament on the double car bombs today in the country's Hiran region. Details coming up. Also, Mali security ministry says armed men attacked a civil defense post in a rare assault near the capital. And Mozambique is officially a member of the UN Security Council for the first time. All these and more on African News Tonight. But first, our top story. Somalian authorities say two bombings targeting officials have killed at least 15 people today in the central Hiran region. Mohamed Daisein reports from Mogadishu, Somalia. The double suicide attack took place in the town of Mahas early Wednesday morning. Mahas is a town in Hiran region about 300 kilometers north of the capital Mogadishu. Muhammad Mohamed Halane. The mayor of the town, who is spoke to state-run television, said the attacks consisted of two car bomb blasts targeting his house and the residence of a member of the federal parliament, Mohammed Abu Jafar. He said the attacks resulted in multiple casualties. He said the anti-peace terrorists have attacked the town this morning with two car explosions. One blast occurred in front of my house, and there are deaths and injuries. Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for the attack. The group said the attacks targeted the main government base in Mahas. Local residents who talked to VOA by phone described the attack as one of the biggest explosions they have ever had. The attack triggered condemnation from local and national government officials. Mohamed Ibrahim Walimu is a member of the federal parliament elected from the region. He told VOA by phone that the attack Wednesday shows that the enemy, mean Al-Shabaab militants, has given up and are reduced to carrying out only bomb attacks. He said their main purpose of doing this is to undermine the great progress that has been made in the ongoing liberation and recent victories. I sent my condolences to victims and wish the injured people a quick recovery. He called on the public to continue working with the army until Al-Shabaab is defeated. Somali government forces backed by local clan militias have recently liberated large swaths of territories, mainly in the state of Hirshabele, from Islamist group which has battled the government and African Union peacekeepers in Somalia since 2007. Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud declared an all-out war against the militants last year. Al-Shabaab has since carried out deadly bombings in the capital Mogadishu, including a devil attack on Somalia's education ministry that killed more than 100 people, mostly civilians. Mohamed Daisane, VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. Mali Security Ministry says armed men attacked a civil defense post in a rare attack near the capital Monday, killing five people. Annie Reisenberg reports from Bamako, Mali. Mali's security ministry said unidentified armed individuals attacked the defense post Monday night in the small southwest town of Marka Kungo, about 80 kilometers from the capital, Bamako. In a statement Tuesday, the ministry said two members of the civil defense force and three civilians were killed in the attack. It said Mali's security forces were taking all measures to identify and arrest the attackers and called on the public to collaborate with security forces. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the Monday attack. Marka Kungo lies on the main road northeast of Bamako, an area that rarely sees such attacks. 
violence in Mali's decade-long conflict with Islamist militants, has been mostly in the north and center of the country, though attacks in the south are increasing. Six people were killed in a July attack on a checkpoint 70 kilometers from Bamako, followed by an attack one week later on Mali's main military camp, just 15 kilometers from the capital. One soldier was killed in the attack, which al-Qaeda's affiliate in Mali called a response to the military governments working with Russian mercenaries and claimed responsibility for the attack. Mali has been under military rule since a coup in August 2020. Mali's military government has denied working with the Wagner Group, a private Russian military company with links to the Kremlin, saying it only works with official Russian instructors. French troops, which were helping fight Islamist militants in northern Mali since 2013, withdrew last year over concerns about Mali's work with the Wagner Group. UN experts have accused the mercenaries of gross rights abuses in countries where they operate, such as the Central African Republic, Libya, Sudan, Syria, and Ukraine. The UN peacekeeping mission in Mali, MINUSMA, has also been in the country since 2013 but has faced difficulties since the military government came to power. Several participating countries have suspended their involvement in the mission, including Britain and Ivory Coast. Mali in July detained 46 Ivorian troops and accused them of being mercenaries. Ivory Coast says they were working under the peacekeeping mission. A Malian court on Friday sentenced the soldiers to 20 years in prison over an alleged coup attempt. Three women Ivorian peacekeepers initially arrested along with the rest of the troops when they arrived in Bamako Airport on July 10th were later released. West African leaders set a January 1st deadline for Mali to release the Ivorian troops or face sanctions. Annie Reisenberg for VOA News, Bamako, Mali. Mozambique officially became a member of the UN Security Council yesterday, joining Ecuador, Japan, Malta, and Switzerland in taking two-year seats they won unopposed in June. Mozambican Ambassador Pedro Comisario Afonso called it a historic date, and Swiss Ambassador Pascal Baresui said she felt a, a deep sense of humility and responsibility as their countries marked their first ever terms on the UN's most powerful body. Countries often campaign for the Council for years. Some 60 nations have never had a seat since its formation in 1946. China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States are permanent members with veto powers. The 10 other members are elected by 193 Nation General Assembly for two-year terms. They are allocated by global regions. To many countries, winning a council seat is considered a signature of diplomatic accomplishment that can raise a nation's global profile and afford small countries a bigger voice than they might otherwise have in the major international peace and security issues of the day. The U.S. House of Representatives failed to choose the next Speaker of the House Tuesday as a group of conservative U.S. lawmakers continued to vote against fellow Republican Kevin McCarthy's bid to lead the 118th session of Congress. VOA's congressional correspondent, Catherine Gibson, has more. For the first time in 100 years, U.S. lawmakers in the House of Representatives have not elected a Speaker of the House in one round of voting, despite Republicans winning the majority. Republican Representative Elise Stefanik. The people across this great nation spoke loudly and clearly that they wanted a new direction. They wanted a new direction to stop this radical far-left agenda, to hold Joe Biden accountable, and to save the United States of America. After three rounds and several hours of voting, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy still could not command the 218 votes, a simple majority of the 434 members of the U.S. House needed to be elected. Republicans hold a narrow lead in the incoming U.S. House of Representatives, meaning McCarthy can lose only four votes and still be elected as Speaker. As many as 20 conservative Republicans objected to his candidacy. Republican Representative Scott Perry. The guy that wants to be Speaker agrees that Washington is broken. Washington, and, and he said as much in one of his most recent correspondences. Interestingly enough, over the 14 years that he's been in leadership, he's done almost virtually nothing to change it. 
and instead voted for conservative Republican Jim Jordan. All 212 House Democrats voted for incoming Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries to serve as Speaker of the House. But with Jeffries and McCarthy unable to command 218 votes, it appears a compromise candidate must emerge. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. As we just heard, members of the U.S. House of Representatives today are trying to select a new Speaker of the House. VOA Capitol Hill correspondent Katherine Gibson joins us now to give us some background on what's happening. Welcome to Africa News Tonight, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. So for our international audiences, could you please explain the speaker's role and why this vote is important? That's right. You know, the U.S. Speaker of the House is one of the most important government officials in the United States because they control the U.S. House of Representatives, one of the two chambers of the U.S. Congress. They're also second in line in the order of presidential succession, So if anything happens to the U.S. president or the vice president, the Speaker of the House then becomes the president of the United States. So it's a position that comes with a great deal of power and influence, and that's why we're seeing such a protracted, intense battle over who serves in that position. So today, uh, does it appear that any positions are shifting in Congress or whether a compromise candidate might appear? Well, that is absolutely the key question here in the nation's capital today. We haven't seen anything like this in a 100 years. Usually the speaker vote is a set deal. Everybody votes for the same candidate. It only takes one round of voting. We're really in uncharted territory here. And from all reports overnight, there hasn't been a lot of movement. What everybody here in Washington is speculating about is that a so-called compromise candidate may emerge somebody who's not the Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, or Hakeem Jeffries on the Democratic side, who we know will not be able to get any Republican votes, but someone that can appeal to all sides on the Republican side. And that's really what they need to be doing. Steve Scalise, who is part of the Republican leadership already, may emerge as one of those candidates. And remember, we also have Jim Jordan, who got 20 votes yesterday from some of those conservative Republicans. So it's really anybody's guess how all of this is going to play out today. And finally, the bigger picture, what are the implications for the U.S. government if this process drags out further? Well, the implications are immediate. You have new representatives, new members, congressional members, who cannot even be sworn in until there's a Speaker of the House. Remember, the U.S. Speaker of the House administers that oath of office to members of Congress. Until a new Congress can be sworn in, they can't pass any laws. They can't set up committees to handle legislation. They literally cannot do anything. They are in a stalemate until this U.S. Speaker of the House is chosen. And one branch of the U.S. government basically is just not functioning until they make that decision. VOA Capitol Hill correspondent Catherine Gibson, thank you for your input. You're so welcome. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. The streets of Tunis came to a standstill Monday as public transport workers walked off their jobs to protest delay in payment. The birthplace of the Arab Spring, Tunisia, has been mired in political divisions and economic upheaval since President Kais Saeed staged a dramatic power grab in July 2021. The country is grappling with a grinding economic and political crisis. Intisar Fakir, a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Institute's North Africa and Sahel program, tells me Saeed's actions represent a major test for Tunisia's young democracy. Yes, so it's, as you mentioned, it's a political crisis that is now coming on top of a economic crisis that has been going on for several years, sort of a slow, uh, brewing economic crisis. And we have really been seeing this for a while, essentially both of these things um, coming together to really form this remarkable, you know, storm for the population where the economy is just 
in, a, in, a, in an untenable situation and what makes it even much more um, difficult to negotiate a solution um, for the ongoing economic crisis is essentially the political situation. <laughs> yes, yes, but but let's talk about the politics here and the the yeah. election. The people of Tunisia empowered President Kais Saeed into that position. They, so uh, correct, they did. Um, if you remember, in 2019, when he was elected, um, it was a, a bit of a shock to this to sort of you know the international. I think most of the international community was a little bit shocked. I think a lot of Tunisians themselves were a little bit caught off guard. But I think overall there was this sense that you know this is a different man. Uh, the perception is that he is not corrupted. The way he is not sort of a politician. The way that Tunisians have been used to politicians ever since, particularly ever since the revolution began in the country um, in 2011. And there was this this idea that maybe bringing someone who's a bit neutral, who has this sort of unvarnished reputation, um, can 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 help bring a little bit of a, a breath of fresh air to a political situation. So when Qais Saeed showed up um, in July of 2021 and essentially said, "I'm going to suspend the constitution. I'm going to really uh, I'm going to suspend parliament." At this point, he had not suspended the constitution just yet. He said, you know, I'm going to suspend parliament and I'm going to sort of take the country in a different direction. There was a lot of optimism um, around what he had done. And there was a lot of hope that there was going to be some kind of, um, you know, some kind of effectiveness, some kind of, you know, uh, dynamism in, in how the country is managed. And that's not really proven to be the case. Uh, in fact, what we have seen over the years is a man who is just very gradually changing the entire political structure and uh, of the country from a kind of a hybrid you know parliamentary system and presidential system to a very uh, presidential system where power is entirely concentrated in his hands he has stripped power from every other um, you know institution public institution and concentrated powers in, in his hand but he did so without really addressing any of the major um, economic challenges, economic issues within the country. And so what we are seeing right now is that a, concentrate, a concentration of political power in the hands of one man who is not really fully equipped to address the country's economic and frankly even political issues you are telling me now it started out with a breath of fresh air and now it's turning to be a little toxic yeah extremely toxic and it's very difficult to sort of really to be optimistic about tunisia at the moment right now because you know the country again is dealing with this economic crisis that's been in the making and that's really been there for for many years fast forward to the fall where you really have uh, more and more the country, you know, basically strapped for cash, not really having enough money on hand to pay for basic services, to pay for imports of food, to cover public sector salaries and such. And you have the government in what seems to be a, a positive uh, development. Um, you have the government sort of negotiated a staff agreement, a staff level agreement with the IMF to implement certain austerity measures. Of course, the big question about a deal like this was, is everybody within the political class in Tunisia standing behind this deal? And when I say is everybody within the political class in Tunisia, here what I'm referring to specifically is the powerful labor unions. Are the powerful labor unions going to stand behind this deal? Are they going to allow for the implementation of this deal. That was Intisar Fakir, a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Institute's North Africa and Sahel program. She spoke to me from Washington, D.C. As Libya's Tripoli-based High Council of State HCS voted to resume dialogue with the East Libya-based parliament on key subjects, Military commander Khalifa Haftar said there was a last chance to draw up a road map and hold elections this year. He stressed that the country's unity was a red line that cannot be violated. Wolfgang Porstai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, explained Haftar's position to VOA senior analyst Mohamed El-Shinawi. 
Hafta and others talked really frequently about last chances for Libya. And many of Hafta's supporters were very disappointed by his speech, which was given on Independence Day in Benghazi. Allegedly, Hafta intended to announce the reintroduction of the 1951 constitution with regional governments in the East and South during this speech. And this was allegedly in coordination with the Eastern leaders, maybe even with Akila Saleh, and probably also with several leaders from the Sun. There are rumors that he was convinced by the United States and by Egypt to hold back and not to talk about this just a couple of hours before, as this announcement might have led to a full escalation of the situation. So if you ask me, what could have to contribute? One option would certainly be to say, like the paper, I will not run for presidency. The UN has denied rumors of a new roadmap for the Libyan peace process after online reports alleged that Special Representative Abdullah Nakhili was set to announce a new framework to try and form a new government. If that was a rumor, who should in fact offer such an agreed upon framework? The problem was if the rumor not so much with the roadmap or with a roadmap, but that it was also about forming a new interim government. And this led to an outcry of all the Dababa supporters. But the Yi does not want to impose any solutions that he will finally not be able to enforce, as his predecessors have clearly demonstrated. He wants to mediate between the various factions and groups in order to help them to find their solution. So any announcement would be probably together with the various factions. But it seems to be that his patience with the current political class is coming to an end, as he is talking more frequently about an alternative mechanism, a wording that has already also been used after him by the US, by UK, by Italy and by Germany. But the Yin knows that the vast majority of the Libyans has a similar position, and he probably envisages something like an alternative mechanism, like a revival of the Libya Political Dialogue Forum, or more likely, and with better perspectives, something like a general Libyan assembly, including the tribes and the elected local leaders. However, keeping in mind that this should be, at the very end, a Libyan-Libyan solution, which is accepted by all, or let's say by most of the Libyans, such a move would need to be prepared very, very carefully. The Minister of Planning and Finance of Fathi Bashara government, Osama Hamad, threatened in a letter addressed to the Attorney General, the head of the Administrative Control Authority, and the head of the Anti-Corruption Authority, to use escalation to stop the flow of oil revenues to the bank accounts of the National Oil Corporation to prevent money from going to the Government of National Unity, headed by Abdul Hamid Baiba. How credible is such a threat? While Osama Hamad, like the rest of the Bashaga government, does not have a lot of influence, the general opinion in the East, and I need to stress also in the South, is increasingly moving into this direction, into towards a new oil blockade. People there are increasingly upset about corruption and what they perceive in unjust distribution of the oil revenues. Remember, Libya has a population of 6 million, and Africa's largest oil reserves. In 2011, after the fall of the Gaddafi regime, I've heard frequently saying Libyans that now they will be richer than Dubai. In 2011, everyone was extremely euphorical. Today, the situation in most of Libya is superficially calm, but not stable. The socioeconomic situation of the Libyans, most of the Libyans, is very dire. The rift between Tripolitania and the other two neglected regions is increasingly deepening. The situation is getting more tense month by month. So I would like to conclude with this situation is not sustainable much longer. That was uh, Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, speaking with VOA's Mohamed al Shenawi. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbili Abaro, and our engineer, Bob Bass, thanks for choosing The Voice of America. <laughs>